has been passed from death to life. He is worthy, worthy of his name. There is no one like Jesus. Lift your voice. Rumors of the Son of Man. Stories of a Savior. Holiness with you. Treasure for the trainer. No ear has heard, no eye has seen. The image of the Father. Until heaven came to live with me. Treasure no other. And you.
church, he will always be holy. He will always be worthy forever. And because of that, we will never stop singing his praises. We will never stop worshiping the King of Kings, the God who is alive this morning, amen. We thank you, Jesus. Hear these words from Revelation 5. It says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. We will never stop praising Jesus for all he's done, for all he is. We thank you, Lord.
Did you, did you get to see why is it that we're saying hallelujah? Did, did you understand why is it that we're saying hallelujah? Because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, died and resurrected again. And when he resurrected, our sins were forgiven. His sacrifice was accepted. We have been justified. We have a new status before our God. We are forever his children, once and for all. That's why we sing hallelujah. And the churches, let's give him glory. Glory to God. Amen. Today is a special day because we get to remember really and celebrate the freedom that we have in Jesus. And today we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, I want to invite the usher, the ushers to please, the ushers to please come to the front. We're going to collect our offering. If you're visiting for the first time, please do not feel obligated in participating in this part of our worship service. This is for those of us that consider this to be our church. I want to remind you that there's always three different ways for you to give. You could always give as we pass the place. You could give online by going to the QR code you find somewhere around your seat. Or uh, if you want, you can send your offerings to the offices of the church. You can pass the plates. <clears throat> as we pass the plates, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to remember why is it that as a church we exist. And if you, just in case you have forgotten, I want to remind you that we exist to be people of four loves. We exist to be people that are committed to love God with all of our minds, hearts, souls, and wills. And we are committed to do that because we have a God that loved us first, that he gave it all first, that he went to the cross to give it all first. That's the reason why we want to love God. We also, we are a church that want to love uh, each other because we understand that we, as Christians, we need one another. We need uh, each other's support. We need each other's love. We need each other's uh, service. We need one another. We don't function well in isolation. Number three, we are committed uh, and we exist to be people that love our neighbors. We understand and believe that the Lord placed us where we are and placed you where you are. So we are light and salt in, a, in, in the places where he has placed us. And lastly, as a church, we believe that we are called and we exist to love the nations. That we are committed to the great commission, not only to the great commandment, to the great commission. That we want to see disciples being made of all the nations. And if you were part of the church, you probably remember that a few weeks ago, a group of us uh, went to Kenya and spent some time over there because we have ministry partners over there. One of our ministry partners there is Josephine, a lady that we have been working with for more than 20 years, and the Lord is using her um, in amazing ways. But um, you may remember that we told you that part of the reason why the Lord has been using her the way uh, she's being used is because as a church... We have been partnering with her financially and with different resources. Now, Josephine has been so touched by you and your generosity that she wanted to say some kind words to you in this Easter service. So please uh, pay attention to this. We are very grateful. We send our greetings to Winton Bible Church. We have been touched by your love. We have been transformed. We are very sure and we are firm and we testify that the love from Witton Bible Church is a heritage from Christ's love and has been passed on to us. We, we are grateful and we thank God for you and we dedicate our hearts to God because of you. Many people have seen God, they have been transformed and many lives that could not have been alive today are alive because of your love. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your commitment. And thank you for your obedience to the ministry of supporting the vulnerable. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you so much. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> People have been saved because of your love. She's talking to you. So thank you for your generosity. May the Lord grant us to continue to be a church that really cares for the vulnerable here and around the world. Let us pray. Heavenly, uh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we get to gather in this beautiful celebration in which we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are grateful, Lord, that as a church, you have made us who we are. 
Lord, we understand that by no means we are a perfect church. We do have struggles and we do have problems. But at the end of the day, Lord, we live for something bigger than ourselves. We want to live for you. We want to grow in our love for you and our growth for one another. And our growth for our neighbors and our growth for the nations. Can you please continue to work in us and through us the way you are doing it? Lord, please allow us to see how amazing, how beautiful it is what you're doing in this world. And we join you in what you're doing, you're already doing in this world. But to do that, Lord, we understand that we need to understand the concept of freedom. Therefore, Lord, I pray that you speak through your word this morning. That you allow us to understand and believe what we need to understand and believe. And we pray for all of this in the name of Jesus. And we all say... All right, let me start with a, with a question. It, it, it's a question that I wrestle with all the time. And the question is this, are we truly, truly, are we truly free? Are we really, really free people? Do we ever get to a place where we could say, I am completely free? And part of the reason why you got to answer that question is because I think that Easter, at the end of the day, is all about that. It's all about freedom. That Jesus lived the life that no one has lived, that Jesus died the death that we all deserved, and that he resurrected to make us free. As we have been uh, walking through this journey together, and we're looking at the Bible as one story, for the last few weeks, we have been spending a lot of time in the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, we talk a lot, especially in Romans chapter 6, about the resurrection. And the resurrection does, and the resurrection has to do with freedom. But as, as we think of freedom, I, I've learned this thing. I realize this thing as I have conversations with people inside the church and outside the church. And it's that basically our definition of freedom is, is out of whack. That our definition of freedom sometimes is more influenced by what people say and the world says than what the Bible says. That there's this tendency for some people to use uh, when they think of freedom, they use synonyms as autonomy or independence or uh, freedom from restrictions. Actually, that is a secular definition of freedom. Autonomy, independence, and freedom from restrictions. But I don't think that the Bible talks about that in those terms. So this is what we're going to do for the time that I've, I have been given. I'm going to give you a provocative statement, you know, very Hannibal way. Two, I'm going to give you an unexpected definition And number three, I'm going to give you a story of true freedom. A provocative statement, an unexpected definition, and a story of of freedom. Ready? No, that was was lame. All right. Ready? There you go. Let's go with the provocative statement. You are not as free as you think you are. Let me say it again. You and you. You're not as free as you think you are. Actually, I dare to say that you're always going to be a slave. And I know that that word slave is a sensitive word, but, but I think it's true. Obviously, when the Bible talks about slavery, it's not talk about in the same terms that we talk in our history about slavery. The Bible talks about a different slavery, and the person that talks the most about slavery, what it means to be slaves to something, is Paul, especially in Romans chapter 6. So everything that I'm going to share today It comes from three verses alone, verses 20, 21, and 22 uh, from Romans chapter 6. And let me just read it at the beginning, and then I will explain. Verse 20, it says, for when you were slaves of sin, can you say the word slaves? You were free in regards to righteousness, verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God or slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's an eternal life. And I want you to notice that Paul uses the concept of slavery in both a positive and a negative way. That Paul Paul assumes that we are all under the lordship of something. That Paul assumes that whatever we submit to, that's our master, that's our Lord. 
The Paul assumes that we all, every single one, one of us is living under the dominion or the influence of something. That we have all been restricted by something, controlled by something, and influenced by something. Notice that Paul doesn't say that you are completely free. Actually, his argument is going to be that no one, no one, no one is completely free. We are all under some sort of master. Now, once again, Paul, when he talks about this concept, he's, he's talking about something positive and something negative. Actually, I want to start talking about some positive uh, applications or examples of what it means to be controlled by something. So I think that every single one of us have been controlled and influenced, and we have been shaped, if you will, by our families and by our, our upbringings. As much as you see yourself as a free person, no, man, you are the product of your family. Uh, now, I don't know if this applies to all of us, but I, I know it applies to some of you for sure. See, I've heard people talking about, you know, a time of rest. They say, well, I need rest. I need some time off. I believe in the concept of Sabbath. I believe in being able to chill and relax. And they start talking about vacation. vacation. And then in the middle of this conversation of vacation, they say, oh, I know what I should do. I should go camping. And in my head, it's like, that's no vacation. That's exhausting. But this is the people really, really mean it. It's, this is the way in which I'm going to relax. And I guarantee you. That, oh, by the way, how many of you guys just struggle? I mean, how many of you guys actually like to do that? Please raise your hand. Now, I want to make the argument, number one, that we are one of the few countries in the world that actually sees that as vacation. I don't know a lot of other countries in the world that see that as vacation. But part of the reason why in this part of the world we actually see that as vacation is because that is something that you have practiced from, you got from your family and your family's family and your family's family's family. Actually, I, I bet you anything. I'm a Christian, I can't bet. But let's say is <laughs> that you inherited your taste for camping from your family. How many of you guys inherited that from your family? Please raise your There it is. Point clear. See, that's not my upbringing. You were shaped by your upbringing. I was shaped by a different upbringing. My definition of vacation usually has to do with a hotel and very little effort. <laughs> that's vacation to me. Amen? Amen? That's just one positive example because there's nothing wrong with vacation. I mean, there's something wrong with you, but nothing wrong with the concept of vacation. <laughs> But I want you to see that you're not as free as you think you are. Here you think that you, that was your idea. No, that wasn't your idea. Who knows, who knows whose idea was that? Actually, let me give you another example, another application when, you, when we think about culture and ethnicities. You are the product of your culture. You are the product of your ethnicity. Everything you are, your upbringing, your surrounding, your history has influenced who you are. So, for example, there are some of us in which we come from cultures in which we tend to be more individualistic. Some of us come from another culture that tends to think more, have more like a group orientation. Well, that really affects how you make decisions. If you are in the individualistic side, you just say, well, I make decisions on my own. If you are on the other side, you will say, well, no, I, I need the advice of my parents and my relatives and my family. Can you see how you are the product of your family? Can you see how you're the product of your culture? Some of us, for example, really, really believe in equality. And some of us really, really believe in hierarchy. Well, that really affects the way you view authority and the way you view leadership. Where do you think that came from? That's part of your culture. You have been influenced by your culture. Some of us are more, come from more soft and gentle cultures, and the other ones more like a little bit more, I would say, more animated and passionate. And I, I think you know which one I come from. <laughs> well, that really affects how we have disagreements. So I'm Colombian. My wife is from Guatemala. And, you, and both of us come from very animated backgrounds. <laughs> well, you should see our argument. Very passionate. But I have friends, some of my closest friends, that actually she's Asian and he is Mexican. And both of them actually, their passion looks very different and their arguments look very different. Actually, my wife and I have gotten to witness their argument live. And he goes something like this. 
Oh, honey, no. No, come on, no, no. And I'm like, that's not an argument. <laughs> I, actually, he walks away and he goes, oh, Hannibal, well, that was awful. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? We are not as free as we think we are. We are the product of our history, our pain, our background, our culture, our ethnicity, everything. Actually, you are the product of the things you love. Rebecca Manley uh, Pippers, she wrote a book called uh, The Salt Shaker, and she says this in her book. Whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by acceptance. We do not control ourselves, she says. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. We all have a master. You just didn't know. We are all slaves to something. That's why I find this so ridiculous when the secular world talks about freedom. I'm completely free. No, you're not. You are the product of your surroundings. You are the product of your love. You are the product of your hurt. You are the product of your experiences. You are the product of your culture. You are the product of your ethnicity. You are the product of your family. You are not as free as you think you are. Do me a favor. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not as free as you think you are. By the way, how many of you guys get uncomfortable every time I ask you to do something like that? (laughs) Woo, nice. All right. Those are the positive, I would say those are positive examples of what it means to be a slave to something. But Paul is not talking about here at this point about something positive. Actually, he says that all of us, to a certain degree, we are slaves to sin. That we are the product of our sin. That even when we think that we are completely free, we are the product of our sin. That sin is our master. That we have this illusion that we're free. And no, you're not free. Your sin is telling you who you are and what to do. But this is why Easter is such an important celebration. Because that is the description of someone without Jesus. Someone slave to sin. But in the celebration of Easter, we remember And which he sang about, that when Jesus died and resurrected, he resurrected to give you freedom. Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, and freedom from the power of sin. This is what we, you know, if you were here with us before, this is why Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. Therefore, what, what Paul is saying is that when we died and resurrected with Jesus, really, We are no longer under the slavery of sin. And someone is going to stop and ask the question, well, then Hannibal, then you got your premise wrong. You just said that nobody is truly free. And now we just see in the Bible that we can be truly free. And I would say, "Uh, wrong. Because you're only reading the first part of the verse. Paul says that we were slaves to sin. And now we have a new master, that we were, our master was a sin, and now we have a completely new master. So this is a different definition of freedom. I would say the biblical definition of freedom. Freedom does not mean that you don't have a master. Freedom means that you surrender to the right master. Did you catch when Paul said that we're no longer slaves to sin, but now we become slaves of God? That phrase should make you uncomfortable. You are not free. You have never been free. You will never be free. Even if you're a Christian, you used to be a slave to sin, now you are a slave of God. That he is the one that rules. That he is the one that tells you what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go. What to, pay, what to think, what not to think. What to say, what not to say. See, Christianity, at the end of the day, if you have really experienced the power of the resurrection, you, are, you, could, you can actually say that you used to be a slave of sin, and now you are a slave of God, even if it makes you uncomfortable. That at the end of the day, we are just exchanging masters. Sin that leads to death 
or God that leads to, the Bible says, to sanctification. That was the text. And if you don't know what that word means, sanctification simply means that we continue to die more and more to the toxicity that lives in us. And that we learn to live more and more to be like Jesus, to be people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. You are never neutral, church. You are never neutral. Either you are a slave that leads to death or you are a slave to God that leads to sanctification and eventually eternal life. So I'm wrestling through this and I'm thinking, why wouldn't I submit to this master? And I think that sometimes we forget who the master is. Actually, I'm going to make the argument that the most intelligent thing you could do, the most logical thing you could do is to submit to the mastery of God. The most logical thing that you could do for your, own, for your well-being is to submit to who God is because of who God, because how God is. It doesn't make any sense to me that we go back to the slavery of sin. When we have such a wonderful master on the other end. If you never thought in those terms, let me just give you a few things. The one that wants to be your master. The one that sent Jesus to die in a cross. The one that resurrected to justify you, to set you free. Is a God that the Bible says is extremely personal. It's a God that is always going to be with you. It's a God that never walks away. It's a God that whatever he started, he starts, he's going to finish. And this is the thing. The more I submit to this God, the more I become like that God. The more I trust that God, the more I become like him. Sanctification. See, the Bible tells me that our God, the one that sent Jesus to the cross and then resurrected, that God is all-powerful. That he could do whatever he wants, whenever he wants it, however he wants it. So for me, it doesn't make any sense that I will be a slave to sin when I could be submitted to the almighty God that could do anything by the power of his word. Did you know that there's no safest place to be than with him? Our God is no wimpy God. He's the all-powerful God. You know how I grow in sanctification? When I start submitting to him and I rely much less in what I, what I think I could do. See, the, Bible, the, the, the God that the Bible talks about is a God that is present everywhere. You know how crazy that is? That objectively, you are never alone. Subjectively, you feel lonely, but objectively, you are never alone. Because God is here, and he's there, and he's there, and he's all over the place. He's all over the place. You are never alone. Why wouldn't I submit my life to that God? See, the God of the Bible says that he knows everything. This is crazy to me because he knows my past, he knows my present, and he knows my future. He knows your past, the present, and the future. He knows the past of this creation, the present of this creation, and the future of this creation. Actually, the Bible tells me that he's above time, and he is above time, and he knows everything there is to know. You actually think that he's going to make a mistake? Do you actually think that he's going to make a mistake when he's got the big picture in mind? See, why wouldn't I submit to that God? The more I submit to that God, the more I become like that God. One of the most beautiful concepts in the Bible that makes people uncomfortable is the reality that God is sovereign, that God has a plan, that God, ac God accomplishes his plans, that he's going to accomplish his purposes, that he's never caught off guard, that we cannot surprise him, and he's not surprised by anything else. And if that is true, I must submit to a God in which I cannot mess his plans up. Let me say that again. There's nothing I could do to mess his plans up. I don't care how sinful you are, how sinful I am. You cannot change his plans for you. Why wouldn't I submit to that God? Why wouldn't I trust him? And the more I trust him, the more I become like him. The Bible tells me that he's a holy God. And a good God. And a merciful God. And a patient God. Everything he's going to do is for his glory and our good. Everything he does is because he's a merciful God. He doesn't give you what, he, what you deserve. 
And the reason why he is not walking away from us is because he's patient. He knows what it means to be a human being because he created us. And he knows that our sin goes deep. And that we're stubborn. And he's patient and never walk away. See, it doesn't make any sense to me that we will continue to be slaves to sin when we can be a slave of the, of the almighty, perfect, holy, faithful, awesome, omniscient, omnipresent God. You, you tell me, does it make any sense that we continue to be in slavery to sin when we can be in slavery to him and become more like him? The more we love him, the more we submit to him, the more love, the more joy, the more peace, the more patience, the more kindness, the more goodness, the more faithfulness, the more gentleness, and the more self-control. That's freedom, you see? Freedom, it doesn't mean that you're not the Lord, under the lordship of anybody. Freedom means that you are in, under the lordship of the right person. Now, let me finish with a story of freedom. Because I actually think that this freedom... It's so powerful that even if everything is going wrong, inside, you're always okay because you are under the right master. So this story I'm borrowing from John Orberg. Uh, in one of his books, he shares this story. and He talks about this woman that he met in a, in a hospital. Her name is Mabel. Uh, an 89-year-old 80 woman. That she was uh, paralyzed, she was blind, she was almost deaf, and she had cancer in half of her faith. So deformed is this lady that the supervisor of the hospital, whenever wanted to train new nurses, they would put her, they would put them in her room because in his mind, if this nurse survives Mabel, she will survive anything else in this hospital. Isn't that crazy? So one day, Jan gets to this uh, lady's uh, room, and it's Mother's Day, and he brings a flower to her and says, this, yeah, this flower is for you, happy Mother's Day. And the lady says, uh, you know, do you mind if I give this flower to somebody else because I can't see it? And he says, yeah, of course. So he, he pushes the lady to another room. The lady gives the flower to a different lady, and the lady says, here, this is from Jesus. And at that moment, this man realized that this is no ordinary lady. That she's not like a regular lady. That's something amazing uh, about her. And then he, something changed. He went from being the one that will help to the one that will be ministered by this really broken person. So he spends about three years with this lady, visits her about two times a week. And develop a really nice relationship. And during this time, he started to take notes of all the things that she would say. One day he started to wonder, what is it that this lady thinks about all this time that she's just laying down? What does she think about when she's alone? What does she think about when nobody's here? What does she think about when I'm not here? So he asked her, what do you think about all these hours, all these minutes, all these weeks, all these years? By the way, 25 years he was in this hospital waiting to die. And the lady says this. Well, I think about Jesus. He says, you think about Jesus? He says, yeah, what do you think about? And she says, well, I think about how good he's been to me. How amazingly good he has been to me. How good he has been my entire life. See, I'm the kind of person that is mostly satisfied. See, I know a lot, that a lot of fo folks wouldn't care much about what I think. And a lot of folks may think that I'm old-fashioned, but I really don't care. And I don't care because I have Jesus, and he is the world to me. Now, somebody needs to answer this to me. How is it that a lady that has nothing, that is blind, that is paralyzed, that is deaf, that is about to die, how is it that this lady finds joy in the midst of her brokenness? And then she starts to sing this hymn. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I'm sad, I go to him. No other can cheer me so. When I'm sad, he makes me glad. Jesus 
is the whole world to me. See? That's freedom. That's what it means to be under the lordship and the right master. Church, why would we be slaves to things that would lead us to death? When we can submit to the one that is great, that is awesome, that is patient, that is perfect, that he loves you, that he will love you all the way to the end. May this Easter may be the Easter in which you're not sure who, to, who you serve just yet. Jesus becomes your master. And that may lead you to sanctification and eventually to eternal life. Amen? Amen. Actually, let's do something. Can you please stand? I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads. And listen, we're not going to take this moment for granted. All of us here have been slaves to sin. And some of us here are still slaves to sin today. And I'm going to plead with you. I'm going to ask you to consider becoming a slave of God. Because in him, all of our longings are satisfied. And in him, we find true sanctification, joy, peace, uh, patience, endurance, all of that. So please bow your head. And I'm going to give you just a few seconds. And if you're willing to make some sort of commitment today, if you're willing to make a decision today, this is the time to do it. You don't have to be a slave to sin. You could be a slave of God. But that word is not just for those of us that are not Christian yet. Just yet. That word is for all of us that we have already professed Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So this is what I want you to do right there with your bow head. I need you to raise your hand so we could pray for you. If you're making a commitment, God bless you here on my left side. If you're making a commitment today, just raise your hand so I could pray for you. Uh, praise the Lord back there. Praise the Lord here in the front. Praise the Lord here on my right hand. Praise the Lord here in the front. Praise the Lord back there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord right there in the balcony. See, today is a day in which we declare the freedom that we have in Jesus. We were transferred from one master to the other. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that for those of us that raise our hand today, you grant freedom. Freedom from the slavery of sin, but freedom to become slaves of God, the one that satisfies all of our longings, the ones that makes everything good, the one that never walks away, the one that is patient, omniscient, omnipotent, the one that sent Jesus to die and resurrect in the cross. Please, Lord, make your image in our mind real today. And we find salvation. And not only I'm praying for those that are making a profession of faith for the first time, but I'm praying for all of us. Because we still sometimes forget that sin is a slavery and that we have been purchased for freedom. Can you please make it real to us? And we pray for all of this in the name of Jesus and the church says. Amen. 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 Let's sing to our wonderful, incredible, risen master, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
which is said that in Jesus we found the treasure we were looking for. Isn't that true? We have the best master. The one that is always good, the one that is always benevolent, the always that is faithful, the one that is always present. You know what's crazy about Easter week? That that word treasure explains why is it that Jesus came in the first place and died and then resurrected. Because just as much we find them as our treasure, the reason why he did everything that he did is because he find you his treasure. No one has loved you like that. Give him glory. A couple of things before sending you out. If you're visiting for the first time, we really want to get to know you. So please use the QR code. Uh, give us your name and your information. We would like to get to know you. I want to remind you that just one of our loves is that we love our neighbor. And Carefree is right around the corner in which we go into our community to serve. So please sign up. That starts next week. And with that, then, let's receive the blessing that Jesus Christ guarantees for us at the cross. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face shine on us so that his ways may be known on earth and his salvation among all the nation and the churches. Thanks for coming, church. We love you. You are sent.